Hi everyone and welcome to my channel. Thank you guys for stopping by. I truly, truly, truly appreciate your support. Um, welcome to all of my new subscribers. Thank you guys so much for subscribing to my channel. I am so glad you find the content interesting because guys, I see all of your comments down below on some of my videos and that just makes me super, super happy. I truly appreciate um, the conversation and how you guys are all engaged. Yeah, I mean, I just really love seeing everybody's comments and I try to respond to as many people as I can. So just keep the comments coming. I really wanna know your opinions and your thoughts on these cases. Also, thank you so much for checking out my last video in my new series called Serial Killers um, You Don't Know. If you haven't seen it, please check it out. Let me know your thoughts on the video, but don't check it out until after you watch this video. So let's get started on today's case. Guys, it's a long case. Um, I may split it up into one or two videos, depending on how things go, um, but you'll know as we get further along. Considering everything that's going on in the world today with the blatant and disgusting mistreatment of black people in America by law enforcement and the government, to be quite honest, I really thought that these um, this would be an interesting case to discuss, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts on it. Today, we are going to talk about Jerry Frank Townsend, Frank Lee Smith, and Eddie Lee Mosley. The lives of these three men were connected by basically a disgusting, tangled web of injustice. Today, I'm going to explain how, and I wanna know your thoughts on why. So first, we're going to talk about Jerry Frank Townsend. On June 15, 2001, at around 9.30 p.m., Jerry's mom and his sister picked him up from Polk County Correctional Institution in Florida, where Jerry had been released from prison after serving almost 22 years in prison. Today, I'm going to talk about what turned out to be, in my opinion, one of the biggest failures of our justice system that I have ever heard or seen. Now, Jerry Townsend was born in Greensville, Mississippi. His parents were sharecroppers. Jerry unfortunately dropped out of school at the age of 14 after only completing the fifth grade. Now, obviously knowing that information, you can guess that Jerry had um, some developmental challenges and reports say that he had the mind of a seven or eight year old. Articles say that he actually had the IQ of somewhere between 50 and 60. Now, I want you guys to keep that in mind as I continue on with the details of this case. After Jerry quit school at the age of 14, he worked in the fields picking cotton um, with his family. He went on to spend most of his young adulthood working odd jobs. He washed cars, lifted freight, um, he did janitorial work, and worked as a laborer for the Hoxie Brothers Circus. Jerry did end up getting married and him and his wife had a daughter. Um, for whatever reason, Jerry's wife and daughter lived in Chicago, Illinois, while he lived in Hollandale Beach, Florida. In 1979, Jerry worked as a laborer opening boxes at a Miami equipment company. Now, in the summer of 1979, at just 26 years old, Jerry's life changed forever. He was arrested by Miami police on September 5th, 1979, while walking home from work. Jerry was accused and ultimately charged with the sexual assault of an unidentified pregnant woman. So one report indicates the victim and witnesses ID Townsend but ultimately the victim never went to a rape treatment center and then refused to testify against Jerry at trial. So as a result of this particular incident, this prompted Miami and Broward County police to question Townsend about a series of rapes and murders that occurred throughout both counties during that time. Now, after four long days of questioning a, a man with a mind of an eight-year-old, Jerry Townsend admitted to raping and murdering women in Miami, Broward, and San Francisco. Now, in light of what you and I both know so far, it doesn't really take a genius to question Jerry's alleged involvement in these crimes. 
I mean, I, as I was researching all the information on this case, that just glared, that was the glaring thing for me. How could police even begin to um, believe Jerry's admissions? He ultimately would make statements that made no sense whatsoever in relation to the victims, like he wanted to rid the world of prostitutes, that's why he decided to kill these victims, when none of the victims were prostitutes. After Jerry admitted to at least 20 rapes and murders, police decided not to charge him for all 20 because they obviously did not have enough evidence or information to do so, but they did decide to charge him with six murders. Now, Jerry's confessions of these crimes were recorded and the audio revealed ramblings and sketchy confessions that should have been red flags for the police. In addition to the disjointed confessions, police had no physical evidence whatsoever linking Jerry to any of these crimes, but they continued on with the charges. Many people who heard Townsend's um, admissions considered them worthless. The recorded confession tapes were stopped and started many times. Um, the detectives were heard basically pressing Townsend, a man with the mind of an eight-year-old, to recount the events of these horrific crimes. Now, as a result of this, Jerry's event, version of events were filled with inaccurate details about the victims, like their race and location of the incidents, but detectives continued with you know, their, their belief that Jerry was the person responsible for these horrific crimes. Miami-Dade County public defender Dennis Urbano represented Jerry um, and said that he basically would confess to anything because he had the mind of a child. Um, he was so severely underdeveloped that he was like a child mentally wanting to please anyone, including wanting to police, please the police. So basically he admitted to these horrific crimes just to make the police happy, just to make them, you know, like him, so to speak. Meanwhile, on the other hand, these detectives were simply looking for anyone to pin these horrific crimes on. Ultimately, Jerry's case became an interagency investigation. And at this point, the Broward Sheriff's Office and Fort Lauderdale Police got involved and began to question Jerry about his alleged involvement in the Broward cases. So in 1979, police took Jerry to Dillard High School in Fort Lauderdale to talk about the murder of a 13-year-old baby girl Sonia Yvette Marion. Sonia was found assaulted and beaten to death in the football field athletic box. Now, when police asked Jerry about the details of the victim and the incident, like her race, what she was wearing, where the incident took place, what time the incident took place, he ended up telling police things that clearly were not true, like the victim was a young white girl, when in fact we know that she was a young black girl. He also indicated that the um, incident took place at night, when that's not true, the incident took place in the daytime. These were more indications that the police may have the wrong person. At that time, Doug Evans, a detective who happened to be black, knew in his heart that Jerry was not telling the truth at that point. Later, Doug Evans would make it his mission to push other detectives to see that they were pinning these horrific crimes on the wrong person. So in 1980, Jerry was charged and tried for the deaths of Thelma Jean Bell, Nehemiah, I think her name is Nehemiah, and I hate the fact that I don't have the correct pronunciation, um, but some of the reports said that had it spelled like Naomi, and then some had um, the spelling as Nehemiah, N-E-H-O-M-I-A. So I hope I am saying her name correctly. Um, her name is Nehemiah Gamble and also another victim by the name of Barbara Ann Brown. He faced three first degree murder charges. He was ultimately convicted of two counts for the deaths of Nehemiah Gamble and Barbara Ann Brown. They did not convict him 
for the death of Thelma Jean Bell. Jerry was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences with a 25 year minimum. Now, Jerry also pleaded no contest on October 4th, 1982 to second degree murder charges for the deaths of two more victims by the name of Terry Cummings and Kathy Moore. He also pled guilty to a 1977 murder of Dorothy Gibson and a 1979 murder, murder of Wanda Verga. All of these convictions and alleged admissions were based on pure intimidation and Jerry's inability to understand the severity of what he was doing. He pled guilty to the two murders and the rape of the woman in Miami who refused to testify against him. Jerry admitted his involvement in the Miami rape because prosecutors told him that if he did not admit guilt, he was facing the death penalty. And the death penalty was Jerry's greatest fear. Imagine the mind of a child thinking, oh my God, I don't wanna die, you know, sh doing anything to please these police officers, he admitted to something yet again that he did not do. Prosecutors tried and convicted this man knowing he had no idea of what he was even being held responsible for, basically. You guys, what do you all think about that? Let me know down in the comments below. My skin crawls when I think about if when I'm going to leave some links down in the description box below where you can read way more details on um, Jerry Townsend's case and all of the information that you see is not is going to be nauseating I can promise you that because it, it's heartbreaking to know that this this man who didn't was not in his right mind was just doing anything that he could possibly do to make police um happy at the expense of his own life i mean i may sound naive guys but i just can't believe the absolute negligence and indifference um, of the police, the prosecutors, and the judicial system. I mean, even judges heard this information and didn't step in and say, hey, y'all, what are you guys doing? Even the prosecutor got this information and didn't step in and say, this doesn't sound right. They were all working together to ruin this man's life at all costs. Thank God for John Curcio, a former Fort Lauderdale police detective and now a Broward Sheriff's detective, and thank God, you guys will not believe this, but thank God for Sonia Marion's mom who asked detectives to take another look at Jerry Townsend's case. Curcio started looking over Jerry's case in 1998 and just like Doug Evans, he noticed many inconsistencies, inconsistencies and became convinced that police had the wrong person. So after two years of searching for DNA evidence in the 1973 rape and murder cases, and after John's persistence to get true justice for the victims and the real rapist known as, quote, the rape man off the streets, authorities decided to reopen the 1979 murders and test the DNA. John, just like Doug Evans, was almost 100% sure that Frank, I'm sorry, that Jerry Frank Townsend was the wrong guy. He was convinced the rape man was Eddie Lee Mosley and he was responsible for at least the 40 rapes and 17 murders that occurred throughout Northwest Fort Lauderdale. Eventually, the results from the DNA testing in the cases of Nehemiah Gamble and Terry Cummings came back and they excluded Jerry Townsend from having any involvement in these cases and implicated Eddie Lee Mosley, just like Doug Evans had been saying for years and just like John Curcio was able to find with just doing a simple DNA test. Mosley also sexually assaulted and killed 13-year-old Sonia Marion on July 27, 1979. This revelation prompted a reinvestigation into Jerry's other convictions because at this point, it's like, 
I mean, obviously they, something wasn't right here. Unfortunately, DNA could not be found for those other cases. But after learning that the um, new DNA testing excluded Jerry, Broward judge, a Broward judge decided to vacate all four of his convictions because clearly there was something wrong with this whole investigative process that took place with regard to Jerry Townsend. Miami-Dade police, I'm sorry, Miami-Dade also followed suit, but begrudgingly, they also decided to vacate their convictions against Jerry Frank Townsend. So at this point, Jerry Frank Townsend was a free man. He was released, like I said, on July 16, 2001, after serving 21 and a half years in prison for crimes that he did not commit. For everything that Jerry endured, the local de police department settled with him in a wrongful conviction suit for $2.2 million. Guys, I know um, $2.2 million is a lot of money. Um, and yes, I do think they should have settled with him and tried to repair or repay him for everything that he's endured. But my question to you all is, do you feel like $2.2 million was enough? This man lost almost 22 years of his life. He lost so much time that he was not able to spend with his loved ones. Um, he lost so much time in prison fighting for his life. I can only imagine what the outcome would have been in this case if he was not able to secure proper defense attorneys who thought enough of him to continue to push and push and push to prove his innocence. I can only imagine what would have happened if John Curcio and Doug Evans, who is who has now passed away, did not push and push and push to say, listen, you guys, we have the wrong person. I mean, honestly, what about the embarrassment and the shame and everything else that goes on with being wrongfully convicted, and let alone being wrongfully convicted of such um, disgusting crimes as raping and sexually assaulting minors as well as adults. Let me know down in the comments what you think about that. So let's talk about Frank Lee Smith. Frank was born July 20th, 1947 to a 14-year-old girl named Ruby Lee Smith. Ruby, Frank's dad, Frank and his brother Reuben lived in racially segregated Valdosta, Georgia. And just like many other African Americans during this time, Frank and his family were extremely poor. Frank, Frank's mom and dad worked as sharecroppers, I imagine probably picking cotton or corn or some other vegetable um, in Georgia. So as a side note, guys, I don't know how many know, but I took the time to look it up just so that I can have a, an understanding. But sharecroppers was, to me, basically another a form of legal slavery, to be honest. Sharecroppers were essentially former slaves that were led to believe they could essentially be their own boss and not be subjected to cruel labor practices and abuse and discipline by slave owners if they would rent land from a white, white landowner and grow and pick cotton, corn, or whatever, and then pay the landowner um, for using a portion of their land. Now, in this system, the sharecropper would never really make a profit because they would usually always owe more than what they were actually able to bring in from growing vegetables or cotton pick you know or whatever the sharecropper would have to pay the owner rent a portion of the crop that they picked it they picked yearly and even pay for using tools and equipment so shortly after frank's birth his father got into some sort of trouble and was shot and killed by police this incident unfortunately left a young girl, essentially Ruby, basically responsible by herself for earning a living, 
and providing for her two boys, Frank and Ruben. Now, unfortunately, Ruby was not able to handle all of this responsibility and totally understandable. Um, she ended up turning to drinking and became an alcoholic. She also suffered mental issues, probably because of the stress and everything else that goes along with being a mom to two boys and essentially doing it by yourself as a young child. Um, I quite honestly don't blame Ruby. Um, I can't imagine living that type of life. So according to Frank's brother, Ruben Smith, Frank suffered a very severe head injury as a young three-year-old baby. According to Ruben, Frank was um, with Ruby at a local juke joint when a huge bar fight broke out. Someone threw a bottle and it hit Frank in the head, basically crushing his skull and exposing so, so bad that it exposed brain tissue. Now, also at 15, Frank was severely injured by another head injury. Um, he was hit in the head with a blackjack. Ba Frank basically suffered brain damage and he never fully recovered. As young boys, both Ruben and Frank and Ruby moved to Broward County, Florida. Ruby, I'm sure, who was still very young at this time, had no real job skills, and she ended up turning to a life of prostitution to earn money and try to do the best she could, it seems, to provide for her children. Sadly, prostitution ended up taking Ruby's life. Um, she was unfortunately sexually assaulted and murdered. Now, similar to Jerry Townsend, Frank's schoolwork suffered. He began hanging with the wrong crowd and started skipping school. At the age of seven, Frank was placed into foster care um, because Ruby just could not do right by her boys. It, it, it was impossible for her without any skills or, you know, the lifestyle that she lived, just she just couldn't do right by them. Frank's foster mother said that he was a very sad little boy um, with severe mental issues. Unfortunately, his foster mom could not handle him and all of the um, issues that, you know, the, the care, she couldn't provide the care that he needed. And Frank and Ruben ultimately ended up going back, um, going to stay with their grandmother. But unfortunately, the issues of poverty and um, just lack of knowledge, it followed Frank. To be honest, living with his grandmother was no better than living with his mom, Ruby. At 13 years old, Frank unfortunately got into a serious, serious fight with another little boy who ultimately ended up losing his life. As a result of that fight, Frank was charged with manslaughter and sentenced to a boys' home in Florida called the Florida School for Boys, located in Okeechobee. Poor Frank just could not catch a break. At the time, this boys' home was known for hog-tying boys, sexually abusing boys, and just straight-up mistreatment of the boys that lived at the ranch. While at this boys' ranch, Frank was abused both sexually and physically, he resorted to drug use. So I think it was like about five years. After five years of being in this boy's ranch, Frank was basically released, left to himself. He was essentially homeless, roaming the streets of Fort Lauderdale as a mentally ill and severely brain damaged young man. And unfortunately, because of life circumstances that were dealt to um, Frank, trouble just kind of followed him and he found himself in trouble again. Now, Frank's brother, Ruben, and some friends um, ultimately convinced Frank to participate in a robbery that basically ended up causing someone's death. Because of this robbery and um, homicide, Frank ended up going to prison and he was sentenced to life. He ended up serving 15 years in prison. Now, Frank was released in 1981 and vowed to never ever get in trouble again. And I am happy to say that Frank kept his promise. He lived a quiet life with his aunt and everything was fine until April 15th, 
1985. On the night of April 15th, someone broke into a home in the Northwest neighborhood of Fort Lauderdale. The person ended up sexually assaulting and murdering an eight year old little girl by the name of Chandra Whitehead. Now this little baby was repeatedly hit with a brick and then ultimately strangled. Now, according to sketchy eyewitnesses and Chandra's mom, a six foot tall man with muscular upper body and dark complexion, wearing an orange t-shirt and jeans was seen near the house. One witness said that she was flagged down by a man with scraggly hair, a beard, and a lazy eye. So based on these few details or description of the alleged attacker, a sketch was drawn and police began to focus on Frank. Now, I'm inserting a clip uh, or a picture of the sketch um, on either side of me, you'll see it. And I wanna know your thoughts. Um, does, does this look like this could be Frank to you? At this point, 37 year old Frank Lee Smith was arrested on April 29th, 1985. Frank was tried based on the witness's statements and Chandra's mom's statement that she saw him through her living room window leaving her home. Guys, this makes me so sad because Frank, he never had a chance, it seems, um, based on his childhood, his upbringing. It just seems like he couldn't catch a break. His attorneys tried to plead insanity and that didn't work. Um, a jury ended up convicting him and sentenced Frank to death. In 1989, governor at the time, Bob Martinez, signed a death warrant for Frank Lee Smith. Surprisingly and happily in 1990, Frank ended up winning a stay of execution. Frank's attorneys continued to fight in court um, with various motions, pleading with the court to hear new evidence, um, you know, just doing any and everything that they could because they were convinced that Frank was not the guy for this particular crime. And they fought like crazy to reintroduce new evidence into the case. Um, and in 1998, the Supreme Court granted Frank's attorneys an evidentiary hearing to present new evidence. It was not DNA evidence, but all in all, it was still new evidence that they were allowed to present. So at this evidentiary hearing, Frank's attorneys presented new evidence of sketchy witness statements and the severity of Frank's mental illness. Frank had gone through a series of psychological evaluations and doctors finally realized the extent of his, his mental illness. Not only was Frank severely brain damaged, he was developmentally delayed, he was legally blind, and Frank was a schizophrenic. Three people testified against Frank, but one witness, 19-year-old Shakita Lowe, changed her story after she was showed a picture of a different suspect. Guess who you think this suspect was? Eddie Lee Mosley. So at this point, the defense requested DNA testing. Guys, this is so sad, but unfortunately, in January 2000, before Frank could get to have his true date in court, he lost his life to cancer while in prison um, essentially fighting for his life. Like I said, throughout this whole process, Frank lost many attempts to appeal his conviction. It was not until November 2000, 11 months, almost 11 months after his death, did the state finally rule that DNA could be tested. And guys, of course, knowing everything that we know so far, I'm sure you can guess what ended up happening. The DNA test ruled out Frank Lee Smith as the person who viciously and violently took Chandra Whitehead's life. The DNA in Chandra's rape kit matched Eddie Lee Mosley. 
I'm, I'm almost on the verge of tears at this point. Every time I start thinking about all of this, it gets me so upset because Eddie Lee Mosley, nothing short of a monster, has destroyed so many lives. So many lives. Frank Lee Smith's family was awarded $340,000 for their suffering. When I read that, I could not wrap my mind around that. $340,000 for, for their suffering, for Frank's suffering. Some people make that in a year and they don't even deserve it. Frank Smith's final years on earth were spent behind bars for something that he did not do. Because again, police, prosecutors, judges, and the state attorney's office did not care. I have no other way to say it. They did not care. If you think something else, let me know in the comments down below what you think about this, this case so far. We now have Jerry Frank Townsend, who lost 21 and a half years of his life for crimes not one crime, crimes that he did not commit. He was subjected to, and his family, the shame of being accused of assaulting young girls and women. Now we have Frank Lee Smith, the same thing, a black man, both of these black men are severely handicapped. You know, they have severe mental deficiencies, not understanding the circumstances that they are being dealt and they are being falsely accused of committing such disgusting crimes that their families have to have labeled or tagged onto them when they had nothing to do with it. It just, it's mind blowing to me that a whole system orchestrated just ruining lives. Now on to Eddie Lee Mosley, also known as the rape man. The entire time that Jerry Frank Townsend and Frank Lee Smith were in jail or fighting for their lives in trial, where do you think Eddie Lee Mosley was? Eddie Lee Mosley was in and out of jail, but mainly he was roaming freely in the Northwest neighborhoods of Fort Lauderdale brutally torturing women and little girls. Eddie Lee Mosley was no stranger to the police in the community. So they can't use that as an excuse. According to Eddie, out of his own mouth, quote, I got a lot of police in the city of Fort Lauderdale knows me. The police pass me all the time. They wave and they say, how you doing, Eddie? The day of Eddie Mosley's arrest, he was found walking and roaming the streets like he always did. He had lived in Fort Lauderdale for 40 years. So imagine the torment that he put that community through. He was an unemployed junk man. He spent hours and hours walking through the city, digging through cans, roaming alleys and streets and vacant houses, looking for any and everything that he could sell or, you know, trade for money, cans, picking up cans, doing all kinds of stuff. He would, like I said, search for anything that he could sell to make a few bucks. I'm sure this is also when he would take the time to look for his victims. The sad part about this is that that community knew who Eddie was and what he was up to. Parents would even warn their little girls to avoid him or stay away from him if they ever came in contact with him. I mean, guys, Eddie was a big guy. He was um, at one point over 200 pounds, over six feet tall, very muscular, big build. He was easily able to overpower um, women and definitely little girls. So at this point, I bet you're thinking just like I'm thinking, if the community know, knew who this guy was, why didn't the police know? Why weren't they even considering him? Why weren't they looking for him? Or did they not even care? In the Jerry Frank Townsend case, I believe the prosecutors and the police detectives had their own personal agendas. 
they could care less whether or not they had the right person. They were basically looking to advance their careers at any cost and at any expense, basically at the expense of Black lives, Black families, an entire Black community. I don't think police cared about these victims. Um, They were Black, impoverished people. And I just feel like the police especially in that that era, they didn't care. I do not think they cared whatsoever. The only two people that basically cared about what was going on in this community were John Curcio and Doug Evans. Doug Evans met Eddie Lee Mosley for the first time on July 23rd in 1973. And from that moment on, he was convinced that Eddie was responsible for the rapes in the community. He actually would just spent several years trying to get other people on board to even consider it. Unfortunately, Doug's family was a victim of Eddie's sick criminal behavior. Clarice Tooks, Doug Evans' cousin, lost her daughter, Arnett, five months after Jerry Townsend was arrested. This basically meant that the alleged attacker, murderer, serial killer was still in the community terrorizing these people. And it wasn't Jerry Frank Townsend. Arnett was sexually assaulted and strangled. Now, sadly, Jerry's conviction seems to be centered around these two detectives Um, who had their own agenda. Tony Fantagrassi and Mark Schlein were the two main detectives in Jerry Townsend's case who were adamant that Jerry was the person responsible for all of these heinous and disgusting assaults and murders. These two men were essentially working to push their own agenda, knowing they had a botched case, I believe. Tony Fantagrassi testified in Jerry Townsend's trial that Doug Evans, the um, former detective who was adamant that Jerry was innocent, Tony testified that Doug Evans had an irrational vengeance, irrational vengeance against Eddie Lee Mosley. Now y'all, Doug did not have an irrational vengeance against Eddie Lee Mosley. He simply followed the evidence like any police officer should. Like I said, unfortunately, Doug Evans died of a heart attack in 2011. I believe that he was able to, I mean, you know, thank God that he was able to actually see that he was, he was spot on with what he believed and what he thought. I'm glad that he was able to actually see that, you know, and to see that, to be vindicated with his thoughts and ideas. Now, I feel like these Police officers need to publicly, you know, vindicate him, but he was at least able to see the right person be held responsible and the wrong falsely accused people, um, one of them at least, get what they were due somehow, somewhat. Now, Eddie Lee Mosley was born March 31st in 1947. He was one of 10 children to Willie Mae Robinson. Miss Robinson has been said to know that something was wrong with Eddie shortly after his birth. Article or piece of research I found said that she knew something was wrong with him because when he was born, he wasn't, he didn't cry. You know, he just didn't do what normal newborn babies would do. Eddie ended up just like just like Jerry Townsend and just like Frank, Eddie also ended up dropping out of school in 1960 at just 13 after completing only the third grade. This really, when I, when you put all of it into perspective, I feel like these families, this community of primarily black people were really, really underserved. Like you have three black men who all have severe mental deficiencies and um, 
disabilities and they are not being properly cared for at all at all i i just it's sad that a school system he dropped out in the third grade because school records show that he had such severe behavior issues and they couldn't properly care for his needs but these families were basically destitute with nothing so what would they be able to do why why i feel like you know there's just like a mul there's a couple of problems here they didn't have any support services for these families and on top of not having support services for them then you just leave them to their to themselves to figure out all of this craziness that they were having to endure and on top of that, you're falsely accusing people. I mean, Jerry Townsend had a mental dis deficiency. His pa parents were struggling. Frankly, Smith had mental deficiencies. His parents were struggling. And everybody just kind of washed their hands of the whole situation and left these families to figure it out for themselves. I don't understand it. In this day and age, you, I, you, that just doesn't happen. Especially now, everybody has all types of support and services. And I'm pretty sure those supports and services were available at some point back then, but probably just not for people of color. Unfortunately, all three of these men, Jerry Frank Townsend, Frank Lee Smith, and Eddie Lee Mosley were victims of their circumstances they shared lives of poverty racism obviously i don't care you can call it what you want that's what it was racism mental issues and abuse eddie lee mosley had been arrested at least nine times for disorderly conduct robbery sexual assault and even murder on June 23rd in 1973, police detective McKinley Smith was driving rape victims around town looking for their attacker when they spotted Eddie Lee Mosley. All three of the victims positively identified Mosley by his limp and a scar that he had on his face as being their attacker. At that point, McKinley called his partner, who happened to be Doug Evans, for backup. At this time, Eddie Mosley dipped behind an alley, and when Doug arrived, they spotted Eddie coming from behind um, a house with women's underwear on his head. At this point, McKinley drew his gun and yelled for Mosley to stop um, and to, you know, get down on the ground. They were going to bring him in for questioning, and Eddie started taking off running, I believe, and McKinley ended up firing a shot over Eddie's head, and which caused him to, um, I think it caused him to kind of, like startled him and caused him to get down. And, and they ended up taking him in for questioning. After this encounter, um, Doug Evans created a suspect photo lineup, including Eddie, and at least 40 women, 40 women, y'all, I'm gonna say it again, 40 women identified Eddie Lee Mosley as their attacker based off of Doug Evans' photo lineup. Now, even with 40 women IDing Eddie Mosley as their attacker, he was only charged with three counts of sexual battery. And what is going to be infuriating to you, because it was infuriating to me, a jury ended up finding Eddie Lee Mosley innocent by reason of insanity. I'm just going to wait a couple seconds and let you process that. Eddie Lee Mosley was found innocent by reason of insanity. As a result of being found in innocent by reason of insanity, Eddie Mosley spent five years in a Florida State Hospital in Chattahoochee. Now, guys, there's more to the story that's going to probably frustrate you just like it frustrated me but 
I really want to know what your thoughts are on this because even after this video is posted, I'm still going to be digging and digging because the, I can't wrap my mind around it. I, I don't understand. I do not understand at all. During the time that Eddie Lee Mosley was in the Florida State Hospital in Chattahoochee, all of the rapes and strangulations in the communities throughout Northwest Fort Lauderdale stopped. But in June of 1979, Eddie was discharged from the mental institution because doctors and psychologists believed that he had improved. He was released with a few stipulations. One of them being he was required to keep up with his treatment, medication, and his appointments with um, a local health facility. Well, by now, I'm sure you all can guess what happened. Um, of course, the rapes and the strangulations started up again. The next four rapes occurred and they were attributed to Jerry Frank Townsend after detectives questioned Jerry during those four days. Remember that in the beginning of the story? Like I said before, detectives were told to look at Eddie for these cases. They reached out to his family, but the family refused to allow him to speak to police. Then his family decided to send him to Lakeland to live with his grandfather to avoid, I guess, any confrontation with police in Broward. Well, two weeks after Eddie arrived in Lakeland, what do you think happened? Two women disappeared. Of course, Lakeland police decided to question Eddie, which they did. And after questioning Eddie, his grandfather shipped him back to Fort Lauderdale. So now it's just like passing the problem, passing the buck between counties and cities, and no one's dealing with it. On April 12, 1980, Eddie was charged with sexual battery and sentenced to 15 years. Now, Strangely, this fool actually continued his torturous, cruel, crazy ways, even in prison. The other inmates were basically terrified of him. One prison therapist who saw Eddie basically considered him a sociopath. But November 1983, Eddie is free again to continue torturing communities because the killings and the rapes, they began again. So for years, guys, this back and forth game with of Eddie going in and out of jail continued, um, being evaluated by professionals and um, these various, some of these professionals pleading with judges to not release him. On July 22nd in 1987, Eddie was indicted for the murders of Emma Cook, and Teresa Giles. Now he went to trial again and the judge ordered him to a mental institution where he was to be evaluated to determine if he was eligible to be released again. On October 17, 1987, a clinical psychologist by the name of Bruce Frumpkin wrote, quote, Mr. Mosley does not appear to meet the criteria for involuntary hospitalization. He went on to say, quote, currently Mr. Mosley's mental retardation and psychological problems do not make him dangerous to himself or others. So I just wanna stop right here and I really wanna know, <laughs> what your all what your opinion is on that as i as i read it again and i think about it um and knowing what i know about the case um i don't i don't understand i don't see how um this psychologist could even put something like that in paper on paper regardless of the fact, like, I don't even understand it. How could they even say that he doesn't seem like he's a danger to himself or others when he's in jail or in a mental institution for evaluation for 
um, after being found innocent just because of his insanity for serious sexual offenses against women and young girls. It's almost as if these people had not looked at Mr. Mosley's um, prior history, like his records. It's almost like they just, oh, got a new person here. Eddie, Mr. Mosley, let's go ahead and see what, okay, yep, let's talk. Let me tell, tell me about yourself. Okay, yep, no, no problem. All right, we're going to mark you down as being good to go here. That's what it seems like to me. Like, they didn't even care. I really just can't believe it. Everyone that encountered Eddie knew he was crazy and not fit to be left alone by himself, let alone with anybody else. Yet, psychologists, doctors, judges, police, attorneys all failed every single woman and child, every single woman and child that lost their lives at the hands of this man. He was free to roam and commit his crimes year after year after year in the same community while they were on wild goose chases with men that had nothing to do with these crimes. Thank God for John Curcio and his involvement in Jerry Townsend's case because this is only when the victims started to be traced back to Eddie. You guys, I I mean, thank God that Jerry Townsend and Frank Lee Smith were exonerated. Um, but it's heartbreaking that Frank never got to see his day. He never got to experience knowing that, hey, you know what? He didn't, you know, they don't, they know they had the wrong person. He had to spend his last years in a jail suffering from cancer without getting to see his day of justice. Eddie ultimately ended up staying in a mental institution and he ultimately died at a hospital in the Florida Panhandle on May 28th, 2020. So just a week and a half or two weeks ago. Now, I just feel like the justice system did not it is so aggravating that justice was not served in these cases. These families violently lost their young women, their young girls' lives at the hands of someone who was absolutely crazy and who had no business being out on the street. And um, this was the time during these years when mental illness was very you know it was popular but they didn't have they didn't have anything to do with these people so they just started letting them roam out roam freely do whatever you know and they were just out people people with these mental illnesses were just not being properly cared for or properly treated the state didn't really care that they weren't being properly treated their parents and their families didn't know what to do with them because they weren't being properly treated and so all they did was covered for them I think that is one of the reasons why this situation played out the way it did. Um, John Curcio believed that Eddie Lee Mosley was putting on an act during his psychologist evaluations, and I honestly kind of agree. I don't think he was as mentally unaware as he played or as people believed he was. Um, I think he took advantage of his mental illness in a way that was so disgusting. I do believe that he was a sociopath and I do think he knew what he was doing wrong. Um, things that I read where he would talk about, oh, he would, he liked to just, you know, things that he liked to do to spend time with, grab a beer, get a drink, do this, do that. He knew what he was doing. I believe, I believe he knew what he was doing. So after everything that you guys have heard, what do you all think about this case? I am interested to know your thoughts. I'm interested to know why you think that this did not get as much media coverage and attention as it should. Um, I believe it didn't. I didn't know anything about this. This is, this is absurd to me. He is basically a serial killer and I never heard of his name until I started doing all of this digging. I never heard of this triangle connection between these three men and how sad that is. I had never heard about this and I just can't believe that I had never heard about it to be honest. And um, 
I really want to know your thoughts on that. I want to know your thoughts on whether or not you think Mr. Mosley was as mentally um, deficient as he claimed he was um, or as he led people to believe he was. Um, police speculate that Eddie Mosley could have at l as many as a hundred victims. And I just really want that, want that to sink in for you all, a hundred victims. Um, I'm going to show you as many victims that I can find their faces, I believe should not be discarded or lost into the sea of forgetfulness because these women, these young girls, these babies, they were all loved. The, these women and girls had families who cared for them and loved them. These women were not prostitutes or just out in the streets. These were women who had families. They were just doing what any peop any other woman and child would do. Go to school, walk to the store, go here, go there. And yet they were attacked and, and taken advantage of by someone who had no business being allowed to walk freely amongst the community. Um, it just breaks my heart to think that these women and these young great babies, these young girls endured this because of careless police work, shoddy police work, a shoddy justice system. I truly believe it's racism at the core of it all, a lack of care or regard, just disdain for people. There was no value placed on these black lives. And that is the part that is just the most disgusting. I, um, it was clearly shown in the actions of everyone who had an opportunity to, to affect change in this case, with the exception of John Curcio and Doug Evans and Sonia Marion's mother. Those are the only three people who cared enough to say, no, we need to take another look. Sonia Marion's mom is a, is a citizen. She's a victim. And she had enough wherewithal to say another look needs to be taken. According to a Facebook page um, that I found that has very, very, very detailed information on Eddie Mosley and how he terrorized this community, none of his victims were involved in crime or drugs um, at the time of their attacks. Sadly, several have moved on from this area, um, from the Fort Lauderdale area. Some have unfortunately succumbed to, not succumbed, but just been a victim of, you know, drugs and um, different things because of probably the devastation and mental and psychological damage that this took on their lives. Um, the Facebook page also indicates that the victims received hardly any media coverage, which is what I talk about all the time, how black women, black children, black victims are always just tossed aside and treated like they are not even relevant or that they don't matter. There was certainly not enough media coverage on this case um, to draw people's attention to what was going on. Even when I did my research, all of the articles were centered around the, the, the injustice that occurred, but very few articles come up about um, the actual incidents of assault and even putting the women's faces and the girls' faces out there to say, hey, do you know where this person was at this time? Have you seen her? Do you know what's happened? I, I didn't see any of those. I didn't, I didn't see very many of those types of articles. Guys, I can't even begin to share all of the information I have found on Jerry Frank Townsend, Frankly Smith, and basically the Eddie Lee Mosley situation. You should definitely check out the Facebook page that I'm going to link down below as one of my sources. Um, the details on that page will further put things in perspective for you and clearly show you how a community was devastated by one man's vile and disgusting acts and how the media and justice system totally disregarded everything that was going on. What's more disgusting is the two detectives who pushed and pushed to pin these crimes on innocent people went to live successful lives. Tony Fantagrassi was able to retire as head of the Broward Sheriff's Office Criminal Investigation Unit in 2005, and Mark Schlein is working as a false claims and whistleblower protection attorney in LA. 
Guys, they are not alone. There are countless or there were countless people involved in these cases who had the ability to affect the outcome or affect change. And they have went on to live their lives like they did nothing wrong. Um, guys, that's all I have for you on these cases today. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you like this type of content. Don't forget to hit the like button. And you can also feel free to share these videos. If you have not seen my last video, I will have the, the link to that video in the description box down below or maybe in the comments. Either one, just check, you'll see it. Um, you guys, thank you so much for watching. Take care and be safe, guys. Bye.